Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. With us today, we're really looking forward to bringing this event to you. We're glad there's so much enthusiasm. This is the first event that we've done in our author series. We hope to do more in the future. So thank you so much for joining. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of USJDA sponsors, partners, and grantors. In particular, I'd like to thank our funders who are supporting this event. That is CGP, the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership, and CLARE, which is the Council of Local Authorities for International Relations in Japan. And without them, this webinar would not be possible. This webinar today is being hosted by two different organizations. That's the US Jet Program Alumni Association and the National Association for Black Engagement with Asia. My name is Casey Neely, and I am the program coordinator for US Jet AA. That's the US Jet Program Alumni Association. And I think we have some new names joining us, which is great, um, but I'll take a moment to introduce both organizations. Um, US Jet AA is a national nonprofit organization that furthers US-Japan relations by supporting the network of JET alumni in the United States. For those of you who are not familiar with the JET program, it is a competitive employment opportunity that allows young professionals to live and work in Japan. It is an opportunity to work and represent the United States as a cultural ambassadors. Most participants of the JET program are assistant language teachers in public schools or private schools through at the K through 12 level. And then some also work as coordinators of international relations doing interpretation and translation. I myself was a JET program participant in Kumamoto Prefecture from 2013 to 2015. USJAA's programs support JET alumni, but we also support the 19 US JET Alumni Association chapters that are located throughout the United States. And we have many different types of webinars. So if you are interested in you know, this type of programming, we definitely encourage you to check out our website. Uh, and I will put that in the chat uh, for all of you to look up later. Um, we also have many webinars on professional development topics, uh, you know, Japanese culture, different things. Um, and lastly, if you enjoy tonight's programming, we also encourage you to donate so that we can continue to hold future events like this. Now I'd like to invite Chadwick Easton, who is the head of Nabia, to talk a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chadwick Eason, and I'm the COO and one of the founders of the National Association for Black Engagement with Asia, or Nabia. We're, uh, we're a global community of Black Americans who engage with Asia and work to create age-related opportunities for Black people and raise Black voices in Indo-Pacific discourse. Uh, within our community, we have, uh, at this point, hundreds of members from a variety of professional backgrounds, including diplomacy, national security, academia, tech, education, and even Hollywood. Uh, although we started our journey in you know, early 2019, we've made what I'd say is great headway in, in reaching out into spaces where Black people are, providing them with or directly connecting them to Asia-related opportunities and ensuring that they have the ability and platform to represent their ideas and expertise as it relates to Asia. Uh, these efforts have really truly enabled us to create the community we have today and Nabia Japan is one of our uh, subcommittees focused on Japan and Japan related exp uh, experiences. Uh, it's one of our earliest and largest communities and many members of Nabia Japan are actually former JETS as well. And I think that's made our relationship with US Jet AA uh, this past year even stronger. Uh, so through our work and our partnerships like this, uh, we really hope to continue to elevate the voices and works of those like Karen Hill Anton uh, so that these stories are recognized for their value uh, and the unique perspectives that they bring, whether that be in education, foreign policy, or even the arts and literature. So given that lens, I can say that I, for one, am very excited to hear more about her experiences. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and with that, I'll hand the virtual floor back over to Casey. 
Thank you, Chadwick. That was really great. Um, and I'd like to mention that I've also recently become uh, a member of Nabia and found it a wonderful resource and a great way to connect with other people that are, you know, in the Asian space uh, dealing with Japan, but also, you know, other other uh, countries within Asia. So I would definitely, you know, recommend you to check that out. And I've included the links for the website and email to get in touch with them if you would like to do so in the chat box. So definitely check that out. Now I'm going to go over the agenda and introduce Karen Hill Anton. So first we are going to, she's going to introduce her book. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about her and then we're going to do a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so I'd just like to let you guys know that if you have questions or comments at any time, during the event, please put those in the chat box. And at the end, we will be asking all of those questions. I know some of you have sent questions in advance and we have those questions as well. And we'll be asking those as well. So um, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce Karen Hill Anton. For more than 15 years, Karen Hill Anton wrote the popular columns Crossing Cultures for the Japan Times and Another Look for the Shunichi Shimbun. As a consultant and coach, she works in the area of cross-cultural competence. She served on the Internationalization and Society Advisory Council of Prime Ministers Keizo Obuchi and Rutaro Hashimoto. She is an emerita of the Board of Governors at Temple University Japan, Shizuoka Human Rights Association, and the Jun Ashida Educational Foundation. Karen has also been a really enthusiastic supporter of the JET program since its inception and spoken at numerous JET, uh, spoken to numerous JETs on numerous occasions. Her daughter Mie was a CIR in Mie Prefecture and her son Mario was assigned to Oita Prefecture and he now makes Oita his home. Karen studied Japanese calligraphy for 25 years and attained Second degree mastery, she has taught modern dance and is now a devoted student of hula. Originally from New York City, she has lived with her husband, William and Tenryu Shizuoka Prefecture since 1975. Her book that we'll be talking about today and hearing from her about, The View from Breast Pocket Mountain, just won its first award. Uh, congratulations from the Book Readers Associ Appreciation Group, Bragg Medallion. This competitive award for independent authors Rated the memoir excellent in all categories. The view from Breast Pocket Mountain is a unique and previously untold story, a treasure trove of experiences, crossing borders and cultures, creating a life and finding contentment in a far off country. To those of you who've ever wondered what their lives would be if they taken the road without a map, this is the book you need to read. And without, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Karen so she can talk a little bit more about the book and also read a couple of passages for, from the book as well. Hello everyone, good evening to the people on the East Coast of the United States where it is evening. Uh, to anyone who's joining uh, from Japan, you know it's morning time here. And we're happily in the middle of um, cherry blossom season. So it's, it's a very nice time of year. I thank you all for being here. And I thank the JET Alumni Association and Nabia for inviting me. It, it's a, a pleasure. I'm more than happy to interact with people who um, not only have read my book, but who are, are interested in, in reading it and who might find something of interest from what I have to say about it. Uh, briefly, um, my memoir begins when I'm a teenager in New York City. I grew up in the Washington Heights area of New York City. And I left the United States for the first time when I was 19 years old. I went to Europe, I hitchhiked alone for about one year. And it would be no exaggeration to say that my worldview changed completely after that ex experience. Uh, I was really never um, the, the same a after that. A and in my own um, estimation, I, I feel 
yeah, that I, I gained a lot from th that ex uh, having that experience. Uh, in 1974, my husband was invited to study in Japan. We'd been living in Vermont. And we decided, you know, that uh, we would leave and go to Japan. But instead of flying directly here, we first went to Europe, bought a Volkswagen Bug, toured a good part of Western Europe, and then drove border to border across the former Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Turkey, Iran, and then Afghanistan. We then traveled uh, using public transportation through Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Thailand. And we were on the road for one year with our daughter who was then five years old before arriving in Japan on June 1st, 1975. Now the place my husband had been invited was a yoga and martial arts dojo or training center. And it was um, quite a prescribed environment and very strict training. The uh, sensei or master was uh, something of a tyrant. And, and I write about the experience of living in the dojo um, in some detail in, in my memoir. And I'm going to read to you now um, just a short passage from the first day we arrived in Japan and when we arrived at the dojo. Arriving at Haneda Airport, Billy changed our money, the $50 we had left. Although crowded at midday, the silence in the airport enveloped me. It was the silence of not understanding any spoken word, the silence of not being able to read. He had the, the directions to the the dojo and got us to the train, though I don't know how he confirmed it, but he said, this is the one we take. If we had looked out the right side of the train, we would have seen Mount Fuji, if it had been a clear day. I don't remember the weather, but we didn't know to look anyway. We had been on the road an entire year. And by that time, we developed senses that told us when we were safe, when it was okay to close our eyes, when it was all right to sleep. There was no sense that could tell us if the water was safe to drink, and that stayed a concern of mine for quite a while. But now, exhausted and vaguely aware, we didn't have to keep our eyes on our backpacks and our child, Billy and I fell in and out of sleep as the train sped us past Mount Fuji. We were met at the entrance of the dojo by a small man who said, call me Noda. Mousy, he looked even more mouse-like as he surveyed us with what seemed to be suspicion. And maybe he was suspicious. We were originally supposed to have arrived at the dojo a full year earlier. Billy had written and said he'd be accompanied by his wife and daughter, but this man Noda didn't appear to expect us. He clearly didn't expect to meet. By the end of the first week, my life had become a routine I never imagined possible. Regimented and scheduled from early morning until late at night, everything we did was planned. There was no time that could be called leisure. But I was fine with it. After having essentially a year of leisure as we traveled, I fell in line and did as the trainees did. Rising at 5.30 in the morning, I joined the others cleaning the dojo. Then it was meditation time. That was followed by jog jogging to a small waterfall. All day long, there were classes, yoga, judo, karate, aikido. From the beginning, it was clear I was expected to join in, to participate and become part of the group. When not scheduled to work in the kitchen with the other women, I was supposed to be in a class. Our daughter was supposed to be there right beside me. During our year of travel, no day was like the one that had preceded it. I seldom knew when or where we'd sleep, what we'd eat, who we might encounter. Now, with no expectations of what living in the dojo would be like, 
The prospect of an ordered life with parameters didn't seem particularly onerous. Our clothes worn out from travel were soon replaced by the unofficial dojo uniform, the blue training wear. And wearing what everyone else wore indicated we could be identified. We had our place in a group in a country where nothing mattered more. Like an orthodox religion with codes of eating and, and dress predetermined, everything was decided for us. It was easy. We left our lives as individuals at the entrance to the dojo, transformed on the spot without a word being spoken into the disciples of Master Jun Yoshida. We were taken under Yoshida Sensei's all-encompassing wing, a wing with an eagle's span. His philosophy of living and personal development covered all aspects of our daily lives. Absolute obedience was a given. Thank you. After my husband fulfilled um, his one year commitment uh, at the dojo, we decided that since uh, we had been living in such a proscribed environment that we'd barely glimpsed Japan. We really you know, hadn't seen anything. And so we said, let's stay a little longer. Well, that was 46 years ago. So needless to say, a little longer became a very long time. After leaving the, the dojo, our first home was at Futokuro Yama. And Futokuro Yama can be translated as Breast Pocket Mountain. And it is from that name that I take the title of my book. Adjusting to life in Japan was a process. It was a process that required me to not only adjust, but to adapt. And I think ultimately accept the society that I had chosen to live in. I'd say it was mostly a painless process. Of course, there have been challenges along the way, but I realized early on, I had a lot to learn and that I could benefit by being attentive and observant, and that I could also not just grow, but change. When I arrived in Japan, uh, I was already a mother, and since uh, living here, we've had three children born in Japan. And so, much of my experience is actually from the perspective of a mother living in a small Japanese countryside community. I'm going to read uh, now from a passage that I would say pretty much describes uh, some of my experiences as being a mother in Japan. In Japan, I felt that a mother is not just a private role within one's family, but a public one as well. There were ways you were expected to behave, speak, and yes, dress. All news to me as my mothering style reflecting my general lifestyle could probably have best been described as free wheeling. One of the few times I rebelled against what I saw as insufferable conformity was when I wore a beige dress to our daughter's elementary school graduation. I knew I'd been told all the mothers would wear black. I'm sure it seems like a small thing, but when you see that graduation photo, it's obvious that I was announcing loud and clear, I'm a rebel. I not only marched to my own drummer, but the last thing I will do is do what everyone else is doing simply because that's the way it's done. Ah, uh, that was the early me. I later fell in line, at least to some extent. Lest my children pay the price for my showing up at PTA meetings and open school days, not as their mother, but the foreign woman who was obviously different. I had to stop with the I'm doing my own thing stance. 
The first things to go were my dangling earrings. Later, the long skirts I'd bought in India were only worn at home. I remember our daughter telling me that when I go to PTA meetings that I should be sure to dress like the other mothers, innocently believing I'd blend in. Well, I dutifully showed up at PTA meetings and open school days, making no effort to blend in, just not stand out. And I had to learn that as a mother, there were always duties and no escape, nowhere to run or hide when my card came up. Although it took years for this to sink in, I did come to see that it was impossible to live in a Japanese community and not accept this basic fact. Your turn will come. Every time I was told that I'd been selected for yet another committee, my first reaction and without fail was no way. But this was followed and with lightning speed by the realization that it was my turn. I wasn't even dreaming of actually saying, no, I won't do it. I got to know local women, other mothers, through the many school and community activities we all participated in. The time I told my kids I'd been appointed Fuku Kaicho, vice president of the Children's Association, they thought I must have gotten the message wrong. Could their mama be in such a lofty position? I called the Kaicho, the president, to check. After all, it wouldn't have been the first time I'd misinterpreted a message in Japanese. And she reassured me, oh yes, you're from Kaicho. I told you on the phone. Yes, I know, I said, but, but I told her that my kids didn't believe me. And she said, I, I wonder why not? Well, I wonder why not to. My father had been head of the community league of 159th street numerous times. I should have let them know I come from a solid line of community leadership. These neighborhood women were the same ladies I once got together with for a boninkai, a year end party. I've been to many Japanese parties and the simplest thing I can say is we don't mean the same thing when we use that noun. But this particular party turned out not to be just a fun get together, but a total blast. Housewives and mothers, one and all, our women only party was a potluck dinner and it was a delicious, if somewhat mixed bag feast of pizza, fried oysters, salad, baked stuffed fish and chocolate cake. I was the only one to bring a traditional Japanese dish, oden, simple and hot, and while I fed the family before going to the party, this clay pot stew of boiled fish cakes was eaten up immediately. Along with the beer and wine, there was, you guessed it, karaoke. Later, someone put on a tape and all my sister housewives started to dance to a song that had the refrain, Popeye the Sailor Man. I recall the song was popular with my daughter when she was in second grade. And then someone said, do you have any dance music? Dance music? I couldn't conceive of a party without dance music. I was home and back in a flash with Hammer, LL Cool J, Salt and Pepper, Tina Turner, Third World, Marvin Gaye, Prince. I put on the cassette and within minutes, the fluorescent lights were turned off and someone plugged in a thing that looked like a crystal ball with garish lights in it that rotated at a dizzying speed. One woman stood on a chair twirling a flashlight while calling out, let's disco. With a lot of loud laughing and talking, it got positively boisterous. There was sweating, taking off of sweaters and general letting down of hair. And well, they could, there wasn't a man in sight. We could never act like this if our husbands were around, my neighbor said. If they were here, they just wouldn't like it. And we'd never feel so relaxed. And even if my, our husbands pretended they liked it, we know they would complain about it the next day. Anyway, we wouldn't be comfortable acting like this around them. Considering the degree to which they were letting it all, all hang out, I asked her if they didn't feel pent up all year long. After all, year-end party means just that. Oh, no, no, no. 
Our husbands expect us to be meek, quiet, and well-behaved. And we're used to it. It's no problem. I couldn't have been more different from these women. What they could accept in their marriages, I would have found not just stifling, but unbearable. Yes, we were very different, but here we were, women on the loose, escaping mothers, housewives gone to hell, partying our butts off. Like I said, it was a total blast. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And with that, I open it up to your questions or our conversation together. <laughs> Thank you. That was really great. I remember I just finished reading the book a couple of days ago, and I remember those passages being very striking, um, especially with my own experience in going to Japan. And I'm sure many in the audience who have had you know, experience in Japan uh, we're going to go ahead and start the Q&A session. So if you do have questions, you can go ahead and write them in the chat. You can use the Q&A feature and we will go ahead and start answering questions. Also, if you want to win Karen's book, this is your last call chance to enter your name and your email and send that to us. And we'll be doing a drawing at the end. And we have a, just to share with you, Karen, we have a, a couple of comments. Um, Somebody said, congratulations on the award. What a great story. Uh, somebody said, escapee mothers. <laughs> uh, we really were. <laughs> uh, such a great passage, fantastic story. Someone said they could really visualize it in their head. Um, disco. <laughs> so uh, one of the first questions that we got in advance uh, was about the cover of the view from Breast Pocket Mountain, which includes a striking image of what the questioner presumed was the author and then a younger girl. Could you talk a little bit more about who is pictured on the cover and the meaning behind the cover of the book? Okay, surely. Uh, that uh, cover, which was taken, oh, well, a long time ago, <laughs> at least probably 40 years, um, it sh shows uh, me typing there in the main room of our farmhouse at Futokuroyama, Breast Pocket Mountain. And, the little girl that you can see walking out of the frame of, of that um, photo is my daughter Mia, the one who was a, a jet. And if you look closely, you'll see she has uh, an angry look on her face. Because <laughs> obviously she's being uh, ignored by her mother or probably maybe I told her to go away while I, you know, I finished writing, uh, who knows. But um, th that's uh, where the... Um, cover comes from. And it was designed actually by the art director of Random House, uh, who worked with me and told me that she'd never worked directly with a author before that, you, generally speaking, with a large publish, uh, publishing house, they decide absolutely everything. And uh, including the cover, the title, the font, um, whatever, you know, would be re represented. But I, I was very happy with that uh, cover. I am very happy with the cover. Someone had a follow-up question. What's over your right shoulder? The Japanese writing on the top of the oh. shelf under the framed picture? Right. Oh, you can see that, right? <laughs> Those are actually two lamps that I bought in Kobe probably 20 years ago. And they were covered in washi, um, Japanese you know, handmade uh, paper but that wore out after many years. Um, there, this has a small small um, oil lamp inside um, and I really liked it. And I decided I would try to, to re-paper it. And I did, um, and writing, uh, that's my calligraphy, uh, writing the uh, work of Y Soup. He is um, one of the outstanding calligraphy calligraphers in uh, Japanese, not Japanese, in Chinese calligraphy, and, and one of my uh, absolute favorite uh, calligraphers. It's really interesting. I remember you included some of that, you know, within your book as well, um, some of your experience in getting into calligraphy, um, which is really interesting. Uh, here's a question uh, that for tonight. Um, can you share how you decided to formatize your book and, you know, what you decided to talk about within your book? Okay, and when you say format, I'm, I'm 
assuming uh, you do not mean um, or it's not meant the the actual formatting of the book, the uploading it and, and all of that, because I, I hired a professional person to do that. But um, if, if you're referring to what I chose to write about in terms of a memoir, um, that really, I would say, came out of, yeah, my uh, many years, number one, I, I think of writing um, uh, my columns, uh, especially cross, uh, Crossing Cultures for the Japan Times. But I, I always knew that the readers of that column and I had many devoted and dedicated readers, they were only getting part of my story. Um, and mostly the part where, you know, uh, once I was living in Japan, but I, I didn't arrive in Japan full blown. I had, you know, a, a full uh, life before um, coming here. And I, I, you know, I was ready to share um, that part of, of my life with, with my readers. And making it a memoir, it's not an autobiography, you can really you know, start where you, you want. And I, I start with my adolescent teenage years um, growing up in New York City. And one, one of the things, I, um, I don't know how many writers are out there, how many uh, people are, are writers of, of memoir, but um, one of the things you can do in, in memoir is you can almost telegraph information. Whereas in, in um, an autobiography, it, they, they tend to be chronicle and, and linear. But for example, I, I write something on the second page of the memoir that doesn't actually happen until page 80. But um, yeah, yeah, that, that was a, I would say an artistic and editorial choice. I think the I think the memoir flowed really well, and you got like a real sense of you know the time passing and. Oh, great. And so I really I really enjoyed the the formatting of it. Um, here's another question: uh, What is or what was the most challenging topic or incident that you had to write about? And this could be in your memoir. This could be um, journalistically or. You know, any, I know you do a lot of writing and have published quite a bit of things. So um, this could be within any of that, I suppose. Well, I, uh, staying with the memoir, I would say um, no doubt um, it was my writing about um, the tragedies that I've um, experienced in, in my life. Um, I, I won't speak about it um, here. Um, people who read the memoir will, will, um, will learn of, of it. But I, I have experienced uh, tra tragedy and writing about that, I, I had to revisit it. Um, and it's not something, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's not something I, you know, tried to hide or whatever, but at the same time, it's, it's not something that, you know, I, I want to, you know, write about and think about. And, and, in, and in fact, uh, and this is the, the truth, I sort of skipped over uh, parts of it, but you know, I had a developmental editor, and she pretty much said, you know, she, I mean, she she understood, but she said, you know, at the same time, readers will expect, you know, to to have this uh, as part of your story, um, and of course, it was up to me whether I I, I did or did not um, write about it, but then I I did it. It was difficult, but I did it, and and I'm glad I did. And we had another comment. Uh, someone said, wonderful, thank you for sharing your story. I always love reading about the experiences of other black women in Japan. And we also had someone who wanted to know, um, you know, mainly the, you know, the focus of the book is a compelling case for staying put within Japan, 46 years in Tenryu in your case, and, um, 30 years in Nara in mind, this is the speaker uh, talking. If you were given the chance to spend six months or a year in another part of Japan, uh, where might you want to live? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd live 10 <tend> you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, well, you know, I love Tokyo. I absolutely love Tokyo. And um, if I could live there in the style to which I'd like to be accustomed, and to which I am accustomed, I have a large, beautiful custom uh, design house. 
that I, I'd be happy to, to be living in, in, in Tokyo or maybe, you know, it's a place like Kamakura. Uh, that's probably where I would choose to live now. But uh, actually considering the pandemic, uh, we've been very fortunate to be living in the middle of nowhere. So uh, for, for now, I, I'm happy to stay put. And changing gears a bit, what would be something, you know, the, the length of the, the memoir covers, you know, the time from when you were younger to, um, you know, as you got older and things like that, what would be something that you would tell your younger self if you, you know, reflecting back? And this can also be, you know, what would you tell someone younger who is just getting started within Japan as well? Join the JET program. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, if I'd had the, the opportunity to to do something like that, I, I would have been absolutely thrilled. And um, as I mentioned, my uh, daughter, second daughter and son were in the JET program. And it, it, it wasn't my doing that that they were, were in, but, you know, they applied and were accepted as CIRs. And uh, we, we were very happy they were um, in the program. In general, um, just, um, yeah, it's, it's not what I would tell my younger self because my younger self actually took every chance and opportunity. So um, it's, I, I don't think I, you know, I missed out on, on, on something, but I would say gener in general to young people, oh, if you ever have the chance or can make the chance or the opportunity to leave your small world, because wherever you are, it's a small place if that's the only place that you are. Um, yeah, go out in the world, go out in the world. There, there's, so, there's so much to, to be discovered. Um, the, I feel you can only benefit from it. Yeah, that's really great. Um, to share a comment, someone remembers speaking to you at a JET conference actually in Tokyo um, to a large group of people just uh, when they were just arriving in Japan uh, before they started teaching. Um, the speaker before you had unexpectedly discour discouraged newly arrived teachers from coming to Japan. Uh, there was a bit of an uproar while he was speaking, but uh, Ms. Anton spoke afterwards. And I wanted to know, um, so this, this person was saying, you know, um, even 20, since that was 20 years ago, um, they were very inspired and encouraged by your words. And um, I guess a good follow-up question is, um, do you have any words for someone who's thinking about moving to Japan or planning to move to Japan? Any words of advice or encouragement um, that you can give somebody? Yeah, again, just in, in a general term, I, I just feel uh, anyone who's planning to come here, I would, would say, come with an open mind, uh, leave whatever baggage you have at home to the extent that you can, come and, and yeah, give yourself the chance, the opportunity to live in this society, to, to work here, to, to uh, get to know J Japanese people, to make friends, um, uh, relationships, uh, you know, build, uh, build relationships with, with your, your colleagues. And yeah, I, even if you know something about Japan, if you've read about it or um, know other people who, who have been here and, and you know, regardless of what their experience is, your experience will be unique, but it can only be unique, I feel, if you come ready to open yourself to Japan and let Japan open itself to you. Um, I, I often say that um, crossing cultures is a two-way street, and I really uh, feel that, that there's something we, we bring and it's, and, and it, there's how we are received in, in, a, in a country, whatever uh, cu culture or country is, is what uh, makes the cross-cultural experience rich. That's really great, yeah. Uh, there's a comment here as a Pat Shizuka, a past Shizuka ALT, so somebody who's on the JET program, I am very excited mm -hmm. to meet a fellow Shizukian. Mm -hmm. um, what have you found to be the joys of living in the countryside? rather than a more populated and cosmopolitan cities within Japan? Well, the joy again right now, <laughs> this past year, to being far from you know, the, the worst of, of the pandemic or, or, and many concerns that people have. Um, 
just in general, I, I you know, um, after we left the dojo, we knew we didn't want to live in, in a large city in Japan. Um, we chose not to live in Tokyo or Kyoto or Osaka. Um, and deciding, I think, you know, to live in the countryside, we, we've just had um, experiences and interactions that I, don't, I just don't think you, you will have in any large city in, in anywhere where, um, yeah, in Japan or probably uh, in any country. And yeah, we get to see a side of Japan that I feel that it's not, um, not often shown. Uh, of course, you know, you know, there are other people who also uh, know about um, the Japanese uh, countryside and country life or Inaka life. But that I, I feel, you know, we, we've been fortunate to um, have been, been live, living here all, all of these years and getting to know really simple people, really simple people. Um, when I, I talk about my farmer neighbors, I'm talking about people who don't go to the town, you know, 30 kilometers away from them. You know, they, they live where, um, where they've always lived. Uh, one of my uh, good friends and neighbors at Putokoroyama at Breast Pocket Mountain was born uh, in Putokoroyama, went to the school there when there was a one room schoolhouse, married literally the boy next door. Her children are born there. there. Uh, she still lives there. Uh, what can I, I tell you? <laughs> and here, here I've come to the other, you know, side of, you know, from the other side, side of the, the world. So even, you know, just even getting to know people like, like that has um, yeah, been wonderful. Changing gears a little bit, um, you know, since you've been living in Japan, uh, there are several questions about how Japan has changed over that time. Uh, I guess you can talk about, someone asked about the current, you know, racial dynamics, how that has changed over your time. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about, like, during this COVID situation, like how you see that has changed Japan a bit. Um, I guess you can uh, talk just a little bit about how you think the biggest changes that you've seen during your time within Japan? Okay. I, without a doubt, I think the biggest change is the fact that there are so many more foreigners here now. Many, many more. Um, there was a time it, um, when we'd been living here when in the city of Hamamatsu, which is the largest city um, near uh, Tenryu, it's a half a million people. I can tell you, we knew every foreign foreigner in that city, absolutely everyone. And if we didn't know them, it was just a matter of time until we met, we were literally just in a matter of time. That's no longer true. Um, there are, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I can't say I see foreigners all the time because they're not around where I, I live. But uh, if you know, I go into the city of Hamamatsu, you see them and people just you know, pass you by like it's, like it's normal. <laughs> And of course, it's become uh, normal. But you know, years ago, if we yeah went uh, into the city and you you know went to a supermarket and you saw another foreign person, you'd stop them. Hello, who are you? Do you speak English? You know, where do you live? How long have you been here? You know, what are you doing? You know, come come to my house. You know, have lunch or stay over. Or just you know, whatever. It's like you you, you wanted to, to build a relationship uh, right away. So, th so that's changed. And of course, the JET uh, program is responsible for a, a good deal of that. And I think it's a, it's a good thing. And, um, you know, uh, whereas too, because there were so many, uh, so few foreigners that, you know, foreigners were pointed at and stared at and, and you know, giggled at. And largely that's disappeared. I mean, you know, it, and it isn't all that, that long ago. I mean, there isn't, I'm sure there isn't a foreigner who doesn't, who's been living here for more than 20 years, who hasn't had that experience. But now, now that it has um, largely um, yeah, just disappeared. I would say where I live, um, there are no, first of all, there, there, there are no foreigners around here, but there are no people who look like I do. Um, if I go to the doctor or the dentist or, the grocery store or the stationers or the post office, it makes no difference uh, uh, whatsoever. Uh, I'll 
I will not be bumping into anyone who looks like I do. And that's my life, and you know, that's um, the, what I, I accept. Um, and when, so and when people talk about racial dynamics, I, I, I know I got that as an advanced question. I really wasn't sh quite sure um, w what was meant. Um, I don't, I haven't, I do not uh, feel any racial uh, animus. And that may be uh, also too, because I don't separate people by races. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't, I never have. Uh, I managed to write a 300 page book and not mention the word race uh, once. And that, and that wasn't um, conscientious. It's just that the, that doesn't play a, a um, yeah, a, a role in, in my life. So if, if there is, you know, some particular racial dynamic going on, yeah, I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you what it is. But again, you know, I live in the countryside. Um, so, you know, I have a particular perspective. But that said, I'm also, you know, not, um, you know, what can I say? Um, not totally unsophisticated. I've, uh, you know, uh, worked for the largest corporations, um, finance co corporations in, in Tokyo. So, you know, I, I do get out and I, I you know, have other experiences, but um, my experience um, in Japan has been in general, as a woman, as a foreigner, married to a foreigner, raising children in rural um, Japan. And not a, again, as a, a black woman, not as an interracial couple, but ju just a, a, as I've said. Absolutely great. Um, we had a couple of questions about um, your career. So um, one person said, how did you decide on cross-cultural competency as your specialty when consulting? Um, and then another sort of similar question is, um, do you have any advice for, you know, blending one's career, you have a career and you're also writing books. So um, doing both activities without having them competing against each other. Well, yeah, um, the, the first part, I didn't so much uh, yeah, decide on um, making a cross-cultural competency, um, yeah, I, I would say um, my uh, focal point, but it is really what I know. Uh, and, I, and I feel that, that that's something that I can share and it's real experience. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, because of you know what I've read or or, or studied, and, and I, I feel that I, I can help um, other people or assist them in their adjustments in uh, you know, not so much assimilating, but living in um, outside of their own cultures. Um, but additionally, and, and because I you know it's necessary um, when you you write a bio on a book. I couldn't write everything that I do in, in uh, consulting and coaching, but I also consult uh, in work-life balance and time management and you know sexual harassment prevention. Uh, I, I, I've done, done all, all of that, but um, uh, probably the, the one I like best is um, cross-cultural competency. And right now, yeah, um, I, I am not consulting as much, uh, you know, writing the, the, the book and, and now uh, promoting it. It's, it's, you know, it's been, um, you know, all hands on deck for like three or four years. Um, so I, I'm doing less consulting at, at this time. I'm, I'm really focusing on, on my writing. And I, and I don't know who, who, who asked that question, but I would say, how do you do both? I don't know what that person's life is. is uh, if they ha also have four children or, you know, or, or pets or whatever, and if they like to travel. Yeah, you, you know, I think it, uh, in general, people work it out by, um, yeah, establishing what, what their priorities are, what's important to them at, at the time. I totally agree. I feel like that's one of, um, the themes of the book of juggling, you know, different things, um, you know, children and family and career and things like that. Um, but so never superwoman. I uh, <laughs> always I want to make that point, especially to young women. I never, you know, I, and, and I know, you know, I've been able to accomplish a, a lot and, and I've also had help. But I always say, um, one, I always feel like 
Japanese women are expected to do it, uh, to do it all and foreign women are suspected to have it all. N neither one is uh, a reasonable expectation and Superwoman is a comic book character. D don't ever uh, strive to be her. Yeah, that's that's a really great um, and good coming from someone who has done so much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so we have a we've had quite a few questions. Um, we'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, we have uh, some questions about the book in particular. Um, do you have any good Moki Carlson stories? Uh -huh. Oh, isn't that interesting? Someone would ask about Moki. It's a long, long time ago. You know, I met uh, Moki Carlson, um, that was in 1965. So you do, do the math. <laughs> and she has since uh, sadly uh, passed away. But yeah, I didn't, yeah, just a short story. She, she was just so um, yeah, exceptional as, uh, as, as a person, but just as, almost like as a personality. Um, she had her own style and you know, even in you know uh, Stockholm uh, at the time, I just remembered. Uh, I don't know. She she had to put on this bright plastic jacket, or maybe it was a raincoat or whatever. And you have these big round glasses. Maybe they were red, but then the raincoat was yellow. And she was was always uh, just being who she uh, was, no matter what. I mean, that uh, she was very. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not just individualistic, but um, it had just a lot of confidence in, in, in the person uh, who she was. Yeah, just a uh, really lovely person. <laughs> and another question, what was the most enjoyable, um, stepping back a little bit from Japan, what was the most enjoyable aspect of life in Vermont? Ah, <laughs> let's see, not the maple syrup, not the... Sh uh, cheddar cheese and certainly not the cold. I guess it, it was just, it was just, um, it's such a healthy uh, environment and, you know, so many friendly people and creative people and, you know, people trying, you know, to um, create a new lifestyle. Um, I, I, I really, I, I loved it there. I, I had many friends and I, I was glad I was able to uh, establish a, a home there. That's great. Uh, we have another question. Going back to your experiences as a mother, uh, were there any practices that you implemented with your kids or did you do the opposite of what the Japanese parent? Were, I'm sorry, were there any what practices? Japanese parenting practices or um, things that you saw Japanese parents that were doing that you also implemented with your own kids? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, starting with, um, and if you said, so, well, some who've read the book will know that I, when my, I said when my first daughter was born in, in Denmark, I was a new mother, I was very, very young and, and had absolutely no idea what I was doing and was just following any instruction <laughs> I, I could find and I would, wake up in the middle of the night and in the middle of winter in cold, cold Denmark and, and nurse her sitting up in a chair. Now, I can't think of anything crazier than that right now. In Japan, the mother would be in the futon with, with the baby and the baby would uh, be happy and the mother would be happy and they both would you know, be able to sleep. Uh, just something as, as simple as that. I, I, I felt, yeah, it was life changing you know, to be able to accept um, that form of, yeah, of, of mothering. Really great. Um, we're running out of time. So I'll just ask a couple more questions, um, but I am also putting uh, Karen's information in the chat. So if you want to get in touch with her and ask more questions or um, would like to chat with her further, you can use that email. Um, there's also her website is there. So I would definitely check that out um, You know, for further information. We'll also be doing the drawing in uh, a minute or so. Um, so please stay tuned for that. Um, I guess as a last couple of questions, I will ask you, um, 
you know, what are you reading now? Um, you know, what recommendations do you have in terms of reading Japanese or Western? And what current projects are you working on that you might want people to know about? Well, I wouldn't want anyone to know about any project I'm working on <laughs> because it would be something in, in progress and, and I, I wouldn't be um, publicizing it. it. But uh, at reading, I'm reading um, someone I've become uh, friends with since publishing my uh, memoir, and that's Roger Pulvers. He is a well-known writer um, in and, and on Japan. Well, actually, he, he lives in, in Australia now, and he also writes in, in Japanese, but um, he has two memoirs uh, out that are yeah, that are just uh, excellent. So I, I would just say any of the writing of Roger Pulvers would be uh, something that, that people uh, should check out. Um, he, he, well, he's a writer, an award-winning writer, a playwright, a uh, screenwriter. Uh, he's done acting. He's a poet. He's, and and he's, he's a historian, really. He's just so knowledgeable. I, I recently finished his um, memoir, The Unmaking of an American, and I felt like it was an education, really. It's really yeah, great. Yeah, just so much I you know, learned about you know, Japanese cinema and you know acting and writers that, that I really... I, uh, didn't know anything about. That's really great. Well, first, I just want to say, Karen, thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, hearing the excerpt from your book. I, I have purchased the book, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. So I'm really looking forward to sticking into it. Um, and also, thank you for being our very first guest on our authors for our very first author series, one that we hope will become um, something we're going to do much more frequently. Um, and thank you for, for being with us from Japan this morning.